Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to discuss with you on the occasion of the Colombian Bariatric Surgical Meeting uh, these issues. And there are, just like there are many roads to Rome, there are many, many issues uh, regarding uh, the, the prophylaxis and treatment of uh, bariatric surgical patients. And I'd like to uh, tell you that I'm going to present what I think is our story based on uh, the Caprini score, but by no means is that the only road to Rome. And uh, I think it's important to understand that. These are my disclosures. And I'd like to begin by talking about the famous findings of Virchow's triad by Rudolf Virchow, a famous pathologist that uh, lived over 150 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he uh, discovered and uh, analyzed the reasons why people get a venous blood clot, he postulated could be related to slowing of the blood flow or stasis, vessel wall injury, or hypercoagulability. And when one is present, the chance of, of a blood clot in the veins is, is, is X. It's two X if two factors are uh, Present And if three, all three factors are present, there's a very high incidence of developing a blood clot. It's a perfect milieu for that development. Now, the reason I'm talking about Virchow is that the anesthetic surgical theater is a microcosm, of what I would call a witch's brew for the development of venous thromboembolism. And everybody talks about the length of surgery, but what's really important regarding thrombosis related matters is the length of anesthesia. Now during anesthesia, there is venous stasis due to calf muscle paralysis because on most times, the patient has to get a muscle relaxant in order to intubate the patient and all the calf muscles will relax and that will allow the veins to dilate because the tension of the muscles keeps those veins from dilating. And when they dilate, they can become over distended and then crack in the endothelium, exposing the subendothelial collagen, which triggers clotting. And hypercoagulability uh, is occurring in these areas because of the slow blood flow. The, the tissues haven't died. So the retained metabolites all are sitting there in this uh, pool of static blood, and that can cause an increase in coagulability. Then, of course, there's an underlying pathology about, the, about which the patient's being operated on, for example, cancer or trauma with fractures and so forth. The time of anesthesia intensifies these effects. It gives the witch's brew more of a time to simmer. And pneumatic compression during surgery is critical to minimize these changes, but it can't absolutely overcome them. Now, here we see a beautiful micrograph uh, from experiments done by Tony Camerata, the famous vascular surgeon. And as the blood flow slows in the veins, the veins expand and they overfill with blood. And as they do that, the endothelium can crack as seen here with these cracks. And this causes exposed collagen, which then triggers the clot, triggers clot formation. And this is, these are 1 million power micrographs. And here's in one of those cracks, the, de the beginning development of the blood clots uh, that again are intensified uh, with time of anesthesia. And here we see a picture of a, of a white cell that changes into an, an adhesion molecule when the flow slows and stasis occurs. And when that happens, that adhesion molecule will actually slow down and it'll come to rest on the endothelium of the capillary. And when it does, it releases granules and an inflammatory reaction occurs. And as a result of that, it damages and destroys the, the integrity of the capillary wall. And you can see the uh, white cell, now an adhesion molecule, penetrating that wall. And here is an actual experiment uh, where this was done. And here you can see the adhesion molecule penetrating the wall of the capillary. Now, the other thing that we notice about blood clots is that after surgical procedures and after hospitalization, the majority of clots occur after hospitalization and when anticoagulants are stopped, over three quarters of them. And recently, this original research from 2008 
was, was uh, again repeated in 2019 with the same results. And we know that high Caprini scores should receive extended prophylaxis. Now, what are the barriers to the preventing postoperative thrombosis? Inadequate data collection. We have enough data to know how to prevent these clots, as I discussed in the previous talk, but data isn't collected. The risk factors aren't collected. And then once they are collected, failure to implement the algorithm of a established clinical pair pathway is a serious mistake. And we know that that's a difficult task these days to uh, implement uh, a, a pathway because people just don't like to be told what to do. We know if we go back in history to when the seatbelts first came out, the public reacted against the government and saying that's a conspiracy, we're not gonna comply with that. And finally, after enough heads went through the windshield, aha, maybe this is a good idea. The same thing happened with uh, uh, recycling. Uh, that's ridiculous. They want us to recycle this stuff, you know? And, but then finally, and now in 2022, we realize that it's essential to help try to save this planet is to recycle uh, uh, things that, that we can do uh, to re reuse them. And so that's very important. And now let's talk about COVID-19 and vaccination. I just read a report today that all four doses of, of the, one of the vaccines results in a 1.5% per 100,000 of a serious ICU uh, uh, admission. So we know that vaccines, sure, they have some complications. Everything has complications, but the vast majority of patients are saved from serious illness or death uh, due to uh, if they'll take the vaccines. Yet look at the resistance that's occurring today. Uh, and and it's, it's really something. So what I'd like to share with you now is the Boston University Medical Center success story. And here is their risk assessment, which is very closely patterned after the Caprini risk score. And we know, as I've already told you, that there's a disconnect between the evidence-based evidence algorithms and their execution as it relates to VTE prevention. The same way as there's a disconnect from this poor motorcycle rider and his motorcycle. And reducing VTE deaths requires mandatory implementation of appropriate evidence-based pathways to be effective. Now, Boston Medical Center is the largest safety net hospital in the New England area, uh, which means it's also responsible for taking care of the indigents. It's a level one trauma center. It's a teaching hospital for Boston University Medical School and the general surgical residency. Uh, the Caprini protocol uh, was mandated uh, and standardized and integrated into EMR. It was automated and easy to use, and it was linked to recommended prophylaxis pathways combined with an early mobilization program. And the program consisted of requiring uh, uh, prophylaxis during hospitalization. If the score was a zero, one to two, three to four, and 100% compliance with that. But if the score was from five to eight, <clears throat> excuse me, Seven to 10 days of prophylaxis were recommended and 89% of the people complied. Didn't make any difference if the patient went home or not. And the 30, day incident, the 30 days was recommended if the score was nine and above and three quarters of the patients complied with that. Now, remember something, how could they do that? Uh, because the cost of low molecular weight heparin is high and so on and so forth. Boston University made a deal with the drug companies and the insurance companies that any patient that needed the, the prophylaxis would be, would be paid for regardless of their individual ability to pay. What a poster child for the US. And look what happened. Between 2009 and 2011, the incidence of venous thromboembolism uh, of postoperative DVT was lowered to uh, three tenths of a percent and pulmonary emboli to one tenth of a percent and now this is really dramatic. This program has been continued now for over 10 years and look at the results. Consistently keeping the DVT and PE rate below 1% after 30 days on the surgical service. What an accomplishment. Now doctors that didn't comply, uh, they were asked to give a reason why they didn't comply and, and uh, they weren't penalized or anything. And most of the time uh, that led to an improved uh, compliance. And then also the results of uh, a particular doctor's uh, practice could be audited 
and compared to what would happen if they use this protocol and using that nudge uh, convince people to uh, go ahead and comply with the program. So Boston University has published 16 articles regarding uh, venous thrombosis prophylaxis and their approach using this program. And I'd like to describe uh, their most recent publication was in laparoscopic uh, sleeve gastrectomy. And there were 81, there, there were uh, 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 a, a total number of patients here. And out of that total number uh, of, of 521, 87% uh, were women. Uh, and the average BMI was 44.4. And uh, 158 patients had Caprini scores that warranted uh, uh, further uh, prophylaxis. Results, including the Boston algorithm from 2000 to 2018, evaluating Caprini scores at the time of discharge and whether patients at high risk of VTE were discharged from hospital on extended courses of VTE prophylaxis. They also recorded if bleeding complications or VTE events occurred in the first 130 days after laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Patients received 5,000 units of unfractionated heparin or 7,500 units of unfractionated heparin if the BMI was over 40 preoperatively, and these doses were continued postoperatively along with sequential compression devices that were used interoperatively and postoperatively. Low molecular weight heparin 40 milligrams a day was prescribed for BMIs of less than 40 or twice a day for BMIs of greater than 40 following discharge for a total of seven to 10 days for scores of five to eight and 30 days for scores of nine plus. Now, it's very important to note that no patient discharged on extended VTE prophylaxis in accordance with the protocol developed a VTE event, zero. Likewise, no patient deemed to be at low risk for VTE based on their accurate Caprini scores, accurate now, I'll we'll tell you what that, why that's there in a minute. Uh, nobody with an accurate Caprini score of less than five developed a VTE event. And in the entire series, there was no incidence of portal mesenteric venous thrombosis, a dreaded complication from sleeve gastrectomy. Now, three patients did develop a postoperative venous thromboembolic event. Again, there was no patients with portal mesenteric venous thrombosis. These three patients, when they came back with their DVTs or PEs, it was discovered that they were inadequately scored. And as a result of that, they didn't get post-discharge prophylaxis. They just got it while they were in the hospital. And in all three cases, a family history of thrombosis was elicited as I said, when these patients came back in after their, di their, their thrombosis was diagnosed, notice that there were no bleeding complications among patients who received extended VTE prophylaxis. And let's take a look at these three patients. This was their ages. Uh, they all happened to be female. Uh, body mass index was high uh, in, all, in, in all three cases. And the Caprini score... Uh, was only listed as four, but that's because they did they missed a family history of thrombosis. And when they came back with their clot, all three, it was discovered, had a family history of thrombosis. And that would have given them scores of six or seven, which would have dictated seven to 10 days of prophylaxis. They all got, uh, two of the three got a DVT and PE, one just a PE, and luckily nobody died. So, in conclusion, the Caprini score is a set point for highest and highest risk patients uh, and, and it dictated the length of prophylaxis, prophylaxis in the Boston model. And the other beautiful thing about the Boston model was they made an arrangement with the drug company and the insurance plans so that nobody who needed the prophylaxis was denied. They all got it regardless of their ability to pay. And that was really one of the, 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 the keys to a high degree of success. No DVT events were seen in patients with a Caprini score of less than five. So at least in this population, this works. Bariatric surgical patients with a BMI of over 40 received double the standard prophylactic dose of unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Incidentally, in this, in this study, uh, nobody, uh, 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 10A assays weren't done uh, in this study and further subdividing the weight above and below 40 uh, BMI was not done. The Boston algorithm, 
coupled with a mandatory prophylactic policy, was very effective in preventing DVT, including the dreaded portal mesenteric venous thrombosis. Failure to track obstetrical complications or family history of thrombosis may result in a serious VTE event or fatal outcome. And further studies are necessary to validate these results. It's very important for us to understand this is only one road to Rome. Not everybody is capable of or can do this exact protocol. So you have to find out what is good in your own environment. And one of the best things to do is to do a prospective analysis using the Caprini score uh, and, and basing it uh, on actual results in terms of your own uh, practice and also what was used for prophylaxis. And in that way, able to, to, uh, to be able to analyze the results and improve your outcomes. So I'm saving lots of time here for questions. And I think that uh, it's very important for you all to know your Caprini score for blood clots and save your life. You can take the risk assessment on my site, as I said before, and no information is retained, but you're able to download it. And I think that I would suggest that everybody in this audience, after this lecture, go take your Caprini score and then share it with your doctors and have them put it in your medical record. And you will be a step ahead in case something happens when hospitalization, illness, or injury occurs. The other thing is, as I, I would emphasize, is that the Resource Center contains all of the, the articles uh, that have been used, which is now over 263 for the Caprini score. All 100 videos are there for you to view on YouTube. So I'd encourage you all to look at my social media sites uh, and anybody send me a question, I'll send you more information. I'm not gonna tell you how to take care of yourself because I'll refer you back to your doctor. But anyway, I hope everybody again has a wonderful Congress. Stay safe and have a great day. And I'll look forward to uh, trying to answer questions. Thank you very much.